How are you? You know, I'm doing great. Uh, we, we, we tried something. We have our new house in Rancho Mirage uh, outside of Palm Springs. And uh, so we decided to put a, a poster behind me here. Uh, now my job is to find a shirt that somehow matches a color in a poster each week. Wow, that's big news. Moving to California. You were in Washington, right? Well, we still have our home on Bainbridge, okay. but uh, for 15 years, we went to San Miguel de Allende uh, in Mexico. We had a home there, and um, it just got difficult to get across with our three dogs, and and my wife loves the sun, and the internet connection is just fine here. I don't, I don't care where I am as long as the internet connection is good, so yeah, that's it's awesome. nice. I, I went to college in L.A. Uh, I lived oh. in L.A. for um, almost four years. Oh, so great. our go-to trip was uh, Joshua Tree. Oh, that's where we're, uh, we have uh, family coming in, and that's where, we, that's where we take them. Yeah. We love it there. I think my biggest regret, re regret in college was uh, we were going to bike to Joshua Tree from La Mirada. It would have been like a oh. two-day trip. Um, <laughs> We chickened out last minute, but we, I used to be a huge biker, uh, like riding fixed gear bicycles, uh, in LA. It was really fun, super wow. easy. So we almost did that. Uh, that would have been the trip for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you climb the rocks, uh, there in, uh, I, I'm actually a horrible climber. I see. Like, <laughs> like worse, way worse than average. Um, you're stuck, man. You're stuck. I am stuck. Um, <laughs> but Thank you for coming over. You know, I look forward to it. And I'm, I'm, I've got some new, I did a new little study this week that I think you're going to appreciate. Uh, your readers will enjoy it. Uh, and uh, we'll see. We'll see. But I'm looking forward to the interview. Yeah. And I, and I, I told this to, to Chris. I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a Merriman child. So you were <laughs> the first person to introduce me to small cap value. I wasn't a crazy uh, investor back then. I mean, I was uh, yeah. an indexer uh, of sorts, and then, and then you you kind of introduced me to this idea of value. Great. It kind of it was it was mind boggling at the time because I thought, of course, the riskier companies are the growth companies. This idea of of buying value companies, yeah, I had no idea that was like, oh, that actually returned uh, better than the market. Uh, uh, at least historically. So uh, thank well, you for and, your education. And one of the things that you might even at some point uh, bring up uh, today or another day is with small cap value being historically such a productive asset class, why not uh, put together your own portfolio of uh, what would appear to be 20 really find small cap value companies for the future. And uh, I would be more than happy to talk about that because you know, a lot of people, that's, they always want to fine tune things. And um, it can be very unproductive, but that's, a good, I think, a good topic. Yeah. Well, you want to start on that and, uh, and talk about why not, why not target individual stocks as a, as a do-yourselfer and, and, sure. and do just that? Well, you know, the, uh, what I have learned about, about investing, uh, you know, first uh, being on Wall Street in the, in the 1960s, but then 30 years later, approximately, uh, learning from Dr. Fama and Dr. French uh, from dimensional funds, uh, I, I, I learned about the, the aspects of diversification with indexes. And they introduced me really to the small cap value premium. Uh, it is interesting to realize that it has not been very many years that this was a common thing for people uh, to, to talk about. But one of the lessons that, that I remember so vividly is that don't be careful. Don't, don't think you're going to outsmart that a small cap of value or even large cap of value uh, asset class, because uh, 
uh, it is obvious that there are at least historically bigger profits to be found there. But they they remind their their students that those those companies are out of favor for a reason. And if you look at a group of what look like good bets for small cap value or large cap value over the next five years, what you'll find is that about half uh, of the companies are still stuck where they were five years ago. And it's the other half that you get the premium and, and that there really isn't any magic to trying to determine uh, what that what might make that difference. Now, since then, we have um, more research that was that was not discussed then, and that is uh, this idea of looking at the quality of these out of favor companies. And of course, Avantis, which is a uh, AVUV uh, small cap value of ETF that 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 Chris Pedersen favors. Uh, our man on the best in class ETF project, um, but, but that they have focused on building the portfolio of small cap value like an index. I mean, it's a passive portfolio, um, but uh, it does focus not just on size, not just on uh, book value versus the market price, but also on the quality of the earnings of those companies. So uh, over time, this is what happens. People learn how to fine tune um, how they invest. We, we, we should never forget that in 1925, 26, the public didn't believe that stocks were a good place to invest for the long term. They really believed that the only true investment was to be in bonds. And of course, that whole idea has been turned upside down but that's in the last hundred years a big, big change in uh, what we know about or what we believe in uh, as it as it uh, as it applies to investing. Yeah, uh, and I'm glad you hit on that topic of quality. I actually made a video not too long ago. Mm. You know what what happens if you target value separately and then quality separately versus finding quality in value. Um, and I was, so I was what, talking, what, what was the, I'm curious, what, what did yeah. you include? Well, historically, um, well, doing value and quality gives you the best risk adjusted returns. And I think that just makes sense intuitively. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna go find the cheap companies, find those that are growing earnings or getting out of that rut <laughs> that they're in, yeah. they either have some fundamental momentum or just some price momentum. Just adjusting for quality gives you better results, risk adjusted. But interestingly enough, um, in the US, um, unlike in the international markets, value, just pure value has actually outperformed with greater volatility. So it's not better risk adjusted, but uh, it's kind of an aberration that that um, has happened. Um, and I was talking to, um, I was talking to Wes Gray, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the whole GameStop <laughs> drama. Uh, and we kind of discussed how, when, if you, if you want a lottery stock, uh, you, you can find, uh, you could just target something like value without the quality. Cause those are the stocks that usually will have crazy jumps. Um, but if you want a more reliable outcome, usually quality, uh, a, an extra quality screener in your value screen aids, aids a lot, uh, which I, again, makes intuitive sense. Well, and, and, and I think it's interesting. I, I don't remember if we talked about this before, but, uh, Avantis came out with this, uh, interesting, uh, study showing the, uh, returns of different indexes for small cap land and small cap value and small cap uh, growth. And uh, there were six different indexes. And if you look at those results, the indexes that had the poorest performance were some of those that had the lowest quality uh, in those asset classes. So uh, the, the challenge is this. This could be true for 15 or 20 years and then for 10 or 15 years, that's not the way it works. And, and boy, that tests the, 
uh, the uh, commitment that investors have to whatever portfolio they put together, because any portfolio is going to have periods of of uh, you're going to you're not going to be happy. I, I can guarantee that you'll have periods of unhappiness. And, and following that thought, you know, some people say that value is dead or value just doesn't work anymore. Now, uh, thankfully, the past couple of years have been better than the past five. Um, but what do you make of that? What what would you say to a person you know, that tells you, I just don't invest in value because things might have changed? Well, I feel a lot of, about that, like I do a lot of a lot of other kinds of comments that I've heard over my lifetime as an investor, going back uh, uh, almost sixty years, and and, and that is almost um, almost everything that that uh, is productive over the long term tends to be counterintuitive. Uh, the, the whole idea of buying out of favor companies instead of in favor companies. The idea, by the way, that an index would do better than smart people managing a mutual fund, unheard of. Well, it was unheard of, of course, and, and, and until Bogle came along with his index fund. But uh, the, the reality is that we have to have some way to judge when a major change has happened that 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 we we can't trust the future to look like the past. Now I struggle with that. Uh, I have a short life left compared to you, Jose, and 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 I, I can tell you that uh, what I know about the past of small cap value, I don't see one thing that would make me change my belief. I just did a study. It was motivated by one of Ben Carlson's wonderful studies where he looked at 20-year performance of the S&P 500 going back to 1930. And so he looked from 30 to 49 and from 40 to 59, et cetera, all the way through 2000 to 2019. And there is nothing any different today from what I see than if we go back to the 30s. And here, here's what I find fascinating is I don't I don't want to focus just on small cap value because I have a hard time suggesting that people put all of their equity money in small cap value. But I would be perfectly happy if you decided your equity should be a balance of large cap bland U.S., large cap value U.S., large cap. I mean, small cap bland and small cap value U.S. I would feel I would feel better about that than somebody who put all their money in the S&P 500 or the total market index. Because when you look at all of those 20 year periods, uh, there is really only one that the S&P 500 outperforms the mix of all four. And they did it by literally pennies, literally pennies after 20 years versus on average over a 40% better return for the four funds over all of those 20 year periods. Well, 40%, that's just 20 years to be ahead by 40%. Think what that could mean for somebody your age where you have many 20 year periods ahead of you. And boy, I tell you, I don't see any reason to give up on small cap value. As a matter of fact, probably more people question whether you should have small cap blend in there. But at the moment that you start taking that on, then why do you have the S&P 500 in there? Why not just have a portfolio that's large cap value and small cap value? Well, I, I my response to that is there are going to be long periods that blend are going to do better. The growth is going to outperform value. And the rewards are already going to be great enough, I think, to have that you know fifth kind of fifty fifty exposure to value and to blend, uh, and and uh, and so I think the odds are better that you'll stay the course. But there's not one thing I can find, including the last twenty years, that makes me think differently about small cap value or the four fund strategy. And I'm glad you mentioned. Uh, the idea of investing 100% in the S&P because that is a very 
popular idea. Yeah. And I, I guess just to be clear, I mean, I'd, I'd rather people do that than go crazy like stock picking or something. Yes. But but tilting just towards value, I think, is such an important idea. Um, I think another thing we can touch on is international. Um, why is it important to invest in internationally? And having said that, um, you know, international stocks look very good on a, on a value basis, at least relative to the S and P five hundred in the U S. So, yeah. do, do you think international investing is is merely f- another way of factor uh, or targeting factors? Uh, as in, if I go internationally, yeah. I'm tilting towards value just because that's you know that's a little cheaper over there. Or is there any other um, important idea when taking into consideration investing internationally? Well, the, the 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 major difference of international, I think, is is adding currency diversification. And what I learned back in the early '90s from Fama and French, uh, and I'm hoping I'm not misquoting them, but uh, that that diversification with uh, with currencies is not about making more money. It's about reducing the volatility of the portfolio over time. Because all the studies that, that, that we have done where we have data that goes back 50 years or more uh, would say that the expectation, or at least what did happen, was that whether you were in small cap value internationally or in the U.S., there was a premium for, for small and for value now, by the way, for large cap value over large cap growth as well. Uh, and so when you do mix a portfolio, uh, we sure want people to make make sure first the factor exposure, whether it's U.S. or international, that is going to be the biggest impact, I think, on your long-term return. But the, the addition of internationals, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm 50-50. Uh, U.S. international, and I have been for a very, very long time. And and it it, it it wasn't because I was chasing performance. I was just trying to find ways to diversify that I would get a reasonable unit of return per unit of risk. Now, in hindsight, obviously, we always know what we should have done. There is no risk in the past uh, because we know what happened. And I would have been better off if I had put all my money in Microsoft, then looking at the S&P 500 or large cap value or any of them. But the bottom line is, if you are not going to be comfortable and stay the course with the internationals, I don't think you need the internationals. You, you give up some diversification. But and, and, and by the way, the ultimate catastrophic event is the failure of this system of of the U.S. market and and the success of the rest of the world? Most people are not going to believe that, uh, even if you could make a case that that's a possibility. I mean, who would have thought that Enron would disappear, seventh largest public corporation in the United States, uh, and those kind of things do do happen. But my sense is you're, you're probably, as an investor, going to have greater confidence, particularly during the period that, that you're struggling not to get the return you thought you were going to get. If you're in uh, asset classes that you have some sense of comfort for the long term, and and, and we have to remember this, this whole uh, country bias is fascinating because uh, in Jason Zweig's book, uh, Your Money and Your Brain, he, he mentions that in uh, New Zealand and in Greece, people there, I mean, those are not huge markets. They don't represent the world. But investors that live there are more comfortable investing there. Now, you know, that's that doesn't make any sense to us because that means you wouldn't have any U.S. in your portfolio. But but that home bias is a is a big deal in terms of comfort for people. And I think you can get, in fact, you can get better exposure to small and to value uh, here in the U.S. than you can anywhere that I know of in the world. 
let's let's go through this um, f- following international. Let's talk about different asset classes or at least different uh, mm-hmm. factors. Um, and I just want to gather your thoughts on that. Momentum. Um, it could be almost controversial <laughs> talking about it because it is it is a robust factor. Um, I don't think there's many people who would deny that, at least in the factor world. Mm-hmm. But targeting it directly in the stock market. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, all I can do is repeat what I've learned from others. You know, I'm, I am not a money manager. I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, my job is to learn stuff and pass it on to the students. And, and what I have learned from others that are deeper into it than I uh, is that the, the cost of, of momentum uh, makes it difficult to capture uh, that, that, uh, that factor. And um, it, is, it may add a, a marginal return. I know that DFA, for example, and I suspect Avantis as well, do use momentum uh, more in their selling, I think, than in their, in, in their buying. In fact, I think one of the great stories about momentum was when I uh, found out that I owned uh, a whole bunch of GameStop. And I owned it in an index fund that was a value fund, small cap value. And I was told, I, I, I may, it may not be true, but I was told from a source I trust that that index fund that owned it didn't get out of it until it was over $300 a share. And that's because of the momentum that it was displaying. It wasn't because they thought it was a great value stock still. It was because they had an overlay that helped them uh, decide how to get out of a position in the best interest of investors. So uh, the, the, the big ones are, are, the, are the size and the value. Those, those are, are certainly, from everything I've learned, going to have the biggest impact. So when we're deciding uh, what small cap value fund or ETF we want to be in, I would certainly be looking at one with smaller companies, I don't necessarily mean the smallest, but smaller companies because uh, there's a range. Some have got $2 million, $2 billion size companies in it, and others have $6 billion companies. And I would be leaning towards the two to three rather than the five to six. And with, with value, I mean, there are many ways to identify value, but uh, I, I would be looking uh, for people who are focused on the book to market from what I know about the past. Having said that, there are people who will do just fine in value uh, using other approaches, I'm sure. Uh, Let's go to the next factor, which um, I guess just building upon what you just said, because we we touched on size, uh, you know, the way I manage my money, I I select the, uh, you know, my my value exposure is is merely value uh, Mm -hmm. without paying too much attention to size. Uh, and the reason, you know, I, I do it that way is because, um, I want to be in value regardless of where the size is. So the more concentrated the value exposure to me, the better, uh, the higher the expected returns, um, even when accounting for size. And it seems to me that size, uh, it's almost a proxy for value. I mean, to be honest, because the, the smaller the company, the more overlooked it, it tends to be. And there is definitely a, a premium for size. I, I don't want to, you know, say that there's no premium for size. There's a small premium. It just might be overstated. But um, you kind of already touched on that. Does is is it is size just basically a, a, a proxy for value? Since you know, small growth has the worst returns out of all four asset classes that you talk about. Yeah, it does, according to all the long-term studies. Um, and I, I suspect that's hard for a lot of people to accept because, I mean, whether it's large growth or small growth, uh, I mean, we're talking about companies that are doing something special that, that, that uh, a lot of folks are attracted to what they're doing and are willing to pay higher P.E. ratios 
uh, sometimes as much as infinite PE ratios because they have no earnings. Uh, and and the, uh, um, I, it, is, it is my belief that a lot of the reason for the pricing of securities is how people feel. Yeah, this is a this is an industry of faith and belief and 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 strong feelings about right and wrong. Uh, I, I don't want to equate it to to religion, but but for some people, their beliefs are stronger about, about investing than they are about religion, and and so it is pretty obvious at times that people have unreasonable expectations uh, for these growth companies and uh, uh, both large and small, but the small ones are the ones, of course, that are a risk of failing. Remembering of all the public companies going back to 1926, I think it's about half of them that have failed. And, and those are going to be because uh, I'm sure they all had a plan, but the plan didn't work out. And, and, and so value companies, um, while they may be out of favor, the implication is you know, we, 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 we bow to the great value investors. Munger just died. Charlie Munger just died. One of the great Warren Buffett's partner. Uh, maybe more important than Warren Buffett was to that uh, partnership. I don't know. But th their focus was on buying stuff at a good price. It wasn't just uh, buying great. In fact, they, they, they were looking for uh, great companies at a fair price. Uh, and so those are companies, though, that for some reason have gone through their own bear market, and then along comes a real bear market that we all recognize. But those that have already gone through a bear market oftentimes do not take the pounding in, in that big bear market that those that have ha, were still hanging on to the picture of, of long-term success and willingness to pay very high P.E. ratios uh, because of the, of the feelings, uh, the emotional aspect of, of investing in those futures. So... I do think there's there the, the, the love my love of value emotionally is that it feels like it's a defensive step to take. I've got a lot of my money and stuff that's already been beat up. I don't have to worry about them being beat up so much because they've been there. Now the question is, can they recover? And history shows enough of them do that the premium turns out to be pretty doggone good. Yeah. Um, mean reversion is a is a phenomenon for sure, and value to me seems like one of the only things that mean reverts upwards. It's like yeah. I'm going back to the mean, but I'm just going up uh, yeah. as opposed to other things. Uh, one of the things that mean reverts downwards though is uh, trend following. So the ninth way in your in your book to supercharge your retirement is to buy and hold. Yeah. Um, however. Both you and I uh, utilize a little bit of market timing. Yeah. Systematically, obviously, there's no second guessing here. But how do you reconcile those ideas? Why, why bother market timing? Well, the reason I don't want anybody who is not really deep into the investing process to try timing is because it is far and away the most difficult strategy for people to maintain for a lifetime. If you think about it, if somebody could convince you to just dollar cost average every month into your 401k and be all equities for the rest of your life, all of history shows us that your probability of success, and I'm talking big time success, is really high. And, uh, what are you asked to do? Well, you're asked to do nothing. And that's something, by the way, that that if we can be convinced that's the right thing to do, it turns out it's pretty easy to do. Nothing. It's like people who, who believe strongly. I do not believe in smoking. I am never going to smoke. 
You know, those kind of people are hard to convince. Hey, come on, just try one. You, you'll you like it, and you don't have to do it all the time. No, I don't smoke, they say. And so they are like a good buy and holder. I don't want to hear your story about there's a way to get out of this stuff and get into that stuff. And uh, I, I can't find anybody who knows how to predict. And by the way, you people who are recommending market timing, uh, I've read that there's nobody that's ever been a perfect market timer. And yet there are people who have been perfect buy and holders. Well, the reality is buy and holders live a life of mistakes. It's all going on. For example, in an index fund, there's mistakes in there. Enron was in the was in there uh, in the in the S and P 500. There's lots of mistakes, and not only that, but both Warren Buffett and, and Peter Lynch, you know, two of the greats, have said that you should expect the S and P 500 to go down 50 percent from time to time, and it's more often than people may like, and yet. Buy and holders are willing to do that. Now, you ask them to use a market timing system, and it doesn't make a profit every time there's a trade. They start, you know, they start folding their arms and say, what's going on here? I thought you were supposed to get me out at the top and get me in at the bottom. No, I never said that. Well, you suggested it. No, I never suggested that. In fact, I told you that you would at times have two to three to four to five trades in a row that are under that are unproductive. And then, unless I put it in writing, they wouldn't remember that because they heard what they wanted to hear. And market timing is one of those stories that people just love the idea that somebody could protect them from the catastrophic and have them there to be on the upside when the market goes up. The problem is the trip is so so uncomfortable for literally 99% of investors. And even I, with a portion of our portfolio using market timing, I would never, ever try to do it myself because I too have feelings. And I know that feelings don't help people make more money. They tend actually to reduce returns and what I want for people who read or follow our work, why do I want low expenses? Because I can see that the probabilities for you in the long term is you'll make more. Why do I want more diversification? Why do I want index funds? Why do I want some value? Everything I want people to do is about the probabilities of increasing their success in the future. And I could not... I could not recommend somebody use timing with the idea that, yeah, this is going to increase your return. No, I think it will reduce your return, not increase it. And yet I firmly believe in it. I mean, I, I, it may make sound crazy, but I do think that in the equity part of my portfolio, a trend following system may get me out just as it did in September or August, September, I guess it was, of uh, 1987. It was just another sell. And when we took the money out of the market and put it in cash in a money market fund, and then the market did something that nobody expected, and it went down 22% in one day. And all of a sudden, I became a genius. I wasn't a genius at all. I happened to be out of the market the day the market went down. And, and, and so the question a lot of people asked me, whose money I was managing, can you do that again in the future? And I said, how can I know? I don't know whether that 22% decline will come from the top of a market or after a big fall. And if it comes from the top of the market, I'm not going to help you because I'm waiting for the trend to show it. And that trend could change. And in a, in a, in a day, you could be down 22%. Even though I know what I was trying to do, how can I call a market top? Nobody can. Yeah. I um, kind of like you. I don't think most people should market time. Yeah. But to me... 
personally, what I'm the most scared of is a drawdown that changes my mind while it's happening, if that makes sense. Where I see my portfolio down 50% and then that's when my feelings get the best of me. So that's all I'm trying to hedge. I'm not even trying to hedge the possibility of like, you know, it's losing 50% if you're not going to gain it back up, that's fine. But losing 50% and then changing your mind but let me, let me tell you, okay, let me tell you where I think you're wrong um, or where there is a better answer for a lot of people who feel like you do. When I look at the history of timing, I find that an all equity portfolio with market timing has a similar expected rate of return and standard deviation as being 60, 40, or 70, 30 equity fixed income on a buy and hold basis. And the unit of return is very similar. Now, if that's that's true, the problem for you is you're a young person and young people are told, put your money all in equities. And you say, but I I don't trust my money all in equities, because when it's down 50%, I I might just give up. And I don't know right now today that I might just throw in the towel and get out and I might miss the next big bull market to which I would reply. Then 100% equity in your situation is totally wrong. And maybe that should be 60-40. Maybe it should be 70-30 so that when it does go down that you know our fine-tuning tables that's what they're about is to show people what it looks like when you're 60 40 or 50 50 or 40 60 when the market goes down and you got bonds in there along with stocks and so market timing is not going to do any better more than likely over time, on average, uh, than having less equity in your portfolio and more bonds. And if you're a young person and you know that about yourself, that you do not have the risk uh, tolerance for 100% equities, you will have a better opportunity and probability of success if you build that portfolio for your limits now rather than waiting till later. I don't care what people say about the right thing to do because the right thing to do is for you to figure out what rate of return you need for the rest of your life and to figure out whether your goal is to get the highest return you can within your risk tolerance or to find the the, the, the lowest risk way to get that return that you want. And those are two different portfolios and you've got to know, am I looking to get the highest return? within my risk tolerance, or am I looking for the lowest risk way to get what I need to get where I'm trying to go? And once people can figure that out, they got it made. Yeah. I I think one thing to also keep in mind is that our perception of risk is dynamic, meaning it's also not just when uh, you know when when the bear market hits that you get scared. It's also that you get greedy when the when the bull run yeah. comes. Yeah. So being, it, I, I think it's just a different exposure almost to 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 have well, market timing because it it changes that dynamic uh, regarding the trend. I I, I do understand it, uh, but but I just want to be careful. I don't back away from the position that there's another way to get where you're trying to go without having to face uh, the decision-making of of doing the market timing. But I want to get back to a comment you made about about the the expectations you might have and then what really happens to you. I think the key to long-term investing successfully is to be an is to know nothing and just put your money in a target date fund. That's a legitimate thing to do. And then don't sit around listening to people like us. Just go about your life. But if you're going to go ahead and become an involved investor, I think it is so important that you understand the reality of investing. 
And let me just give you a little touch of this, because I want to go back to that study that that uh, uh, Carlson did that motivated me to do an additional study. But I want you just to hear these returns over the 20 year periods for a one dollar investment in the S&P 500. This is starting in 1930. Two dollars and thirty nine cents 20 years later, starting in 1940, fourteen dollars and ten cents 20 years later, uh, starting in uh, 1950, twelve dollars and forty five cents, 1960, three dollars and seventy five cents. And by the way, if I just jump to the 2000 to 2019, three dollars and twenty four cents, it's not too dissimilar from what happened from 1930 to 1949. So what does this tell me? It tells me that if I'm a young person, I'm going to have to ride through all of this stuff. Well, a young person may be just confident enough. They know what technology stocks to be in. And the problem with those people is they didn't know the right ones to be in, but I do, but I know you don't because nobody does, except in hindsight. What I'm saying is I really think it's important for an investor to know what that glide path is going to look like. See, it's one thing for Vanguard to create a, a, a glide path for the combination of equities and fixed income in a target date fund. And as you get older, you're going to have more fixed income in your portfolio. And it's all very neat and tidy. But what is not neat and tidy are the returns you actually get over that period of time. And some people will go 40 years and have an amazing, amazing retirement. And other people will go 40 years and it will be the pits moving in with your kids. Okay. I mean, the, the, but, but we as investors need to do this with the knowledge of what that ride is going to be like. Would there be as many divorces if people had any idea what the difference between the courtship, the honeymoon and reality is? I suspect not. And yet, if we recommend young people go get some, some therapy, they'd laugh at us. To prepare, by the way, for the reality. <laughs> sure. Yep. Uh, Morgan Housel has this quote, and I'm, I'm definitely going to say it the wrong way, probably. I'm going to butcher this. But um, he says, uh, every drawdown in the past looks like an opportunity, and every drawdown in the future looks like a risk. Yes, uh, I love it. And it's, uh, it's, yeah, that's the thing. I, I think people should take on risk. You know, uh, if you do away with all your risk, you're basically T bills back again. So, um, yeah. knowing how to take that risk is, is, is everything in investing now. And, and when I just make one more comment, Jose, sure. that I, people forget that running a portfolio, you're the boss of a company. It's a very big company. You have millions of employees if you're in index funds. Uh, you, you have uh, all these folks getting up, going to work for you every day. You'll never know them, but legitimately they are working for you, uh, just like the owner of any other business. Now, when you actually own the business, all of a sudden you have some control and, and 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 that control allows you to make changes to try to 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 adjust things to make the business better whether whether it means being more aggressive in collecting receivables making sure the inventory turns are good I mean, there's a whole bunch of business decisions that go on inside of any legitimate business and, and just managing the expectations of the people that work for you. I mean, that's a full-time job by itself. And with your portfolio, to the extent that you can, what we want people to do is to control what they can control and then just step back and let your employees do the work. And for what it's worth, employees as a group have done a pretty doggone good job. I just saw uh, a report that came out about the people in the state of, uh, 
I don't know, it was California or New York and the state of Washington where, I, where my wife and I live. And the additional value that people created by the hour who worked in those states, it's phenomenal. And so those people are working for me. My wife and I have over $12,000 in our port. I'm 12,000 uh, stocks in our portfolio. Each one, a company trying to make money. Are there crooks out there? Of course. Are, are, are there crooks in Wall, on Wall Street? Of course. Are there financial planners who are thinking about themselves instead of you? Of course. But your job in the business you're putting together for your lifetime is to try to control access to what you have saved to the crooks and the, and, and the people who aren't doing a decent hour day's work for you. And you can do that, and you can do it through index fund. I mean, this is the thing that's so amazing today compared to when I was your age. I mean, what, boy, this business was not for the investor. It was for, it was for Wall Street. There was a fortune to be made by Wall Street. Today, the fortune is to be made by the investor if they do it right. And that means to make sure they control everything they can control and sit back. And if you're a cigar smoker, light up. If you're a drinker, drink. Or if you just have a life to live and now don't want to worry about all these businesses you own, you can just walk away and not worry. It's heaven. Or, or in some people's idea, it's heaven. Yeah. Uh, it's such a it's such a good way to do things um, with the technology even available today. M1 Finance, by the way, being a, such a such a good example of how automation can make your life easier. Uh, you know, I have friends who who do real estate, and I have people who own businesses, and it's just my investing is just like I don't even I actually don't even know what's going on today. Yeah, <laughs> this is just let it ride. It's so much uh, simpler, and I think uh, yeah, well, I think I'm gonna we could take advantage of that. I'm going to give you a hint. Small value is doing great today. Great. There you go. <laughs> there you go. You know why I look? I, I look because I know there are so many people that follow our work that they've got small cap value. And when I was in the industry as an advisor, I, was, I had anxiety all week during the market. Saturday and Sunday were the only days my brain would relax because I felt some responsibility for the people I worked for. And when the market was open, I knew that many of them, not all of them, were making judgments one hour at a time. And I just, I felt terrible for them. But on weekends, we could all relax. And in essence, you found a way to invest. And it's always weekends to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I still peak quite a bit. Uh, I, I, I keep up with the market. I, I guess it was just more an, an example of today because I've been working all morning, so I haven't checked in. You know, let's talk about that addiction. That's a big deal. It's a really big deal because, remember, addictions are things we have a hard time controlling, right? And so if one has an addiction to that news and it suggests that, while you may not trust all of that news, you trust part of it. You're not sure which part to trust, actually, but you know that maybe you'll be smart enough to tell the difference. But you see the market go in one direction, and then something comes on the news, and you think, oh, that's bad. That's really bad. And the market's going down. Whoa, this could get a lot worse than it's doing right now. And all of a sudden, you get you do. That addiction traps people into wanting to do something about it. And so often, they may go years or months or weeks. I've seen it happen in weeks to people where they put those things together in their mind. And the only answer for them to deal with their addiction is to get out and stop the pain, stop the worry, 
And that means you're in a money market fund where we know that the one thing that's guaranteed from the past is that you basically, after inflation, didn't make any money in money market funds. And yet the brain, boy, it hears those stories and it puts them together. And I was told, just as I'm sure you were told at some point in your life, people do not buy the steak, they buy the sizzle. And that sizzle is a story. And those stories, boy, stories sell, stories make people panic, stories can cause so much damage. So the further you can get away from letting those stories even start to be generated in your head for most investors is a huge step in the right direction in terms of being a successful investor. Yeah, and as a kind of as proof as evidence of what you just mentioned, these past 2 3 years, 4 years since since COVID, it's been just a crazy time in the market like I, I, I mean, this is. I started investing in 2020 just because that's when uh, I had enough money to 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 mm -hmm. to, to start off. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of young, but um, what a ride! What a ride it's been in the past uh, four years. In the past two years, there's so many people calling shots, and the market basically has done. Uh, what what is the quote again? The market does whatever is gonna make uh, make the most fool out of the most amount of people. Is that yeah? Yeah, that's what well, the market's been doing. Well, and the problem for a lot of people is they don't keep a diary. And we have selective memory. When I was a stockbroker for a couple of years back in the 1960s, what I found quickly was if somebody invested in a stock that I recommended and it went up, it was their idea. If it went down, it was my idea. And, and, and so we forget what we really believed at the moment. And if you had kept a diary over that since 1920 about how you felt each day and what you wanted to do, if you could have done it, you would maybe have learned that as, as would be true of literally all of us is that what we believed on that day at the end of that day is far from the truth. I mean, if you had known that COVID was going to be there, would you have wanted to be around anywhere around the market? I mean, that's the point you just made. Uh, it was, who would want to be there? There were people who lost hundreds of millions of dollars uh, when Trump got elected because they made the bet that the market was going to go down if Trump got elected. And instead of making a lot of money, by the next day, they had lost a ton of money. And, and, and it's, it's hard. It's very, very hard. And, and by the way, if you haven't become a student of the psychology of the individual, there are all sorts of articles about the four types of investors there are, you know, those that want adventure and those that are conservative. You got to fight your way through whoever you are and try to get to where you want to be. And if you are a person who is afraid of the market, I don't mean you, but if somebody is afraid of the market, boy, it's hard to make you into a buy and holder. Because if you're really afraid, that emotion will become way stronger than your commitment to the long-term buy and hold strategy. And so there again is a, is a place where we got to be sure that people who are legitimately afraid uh, address that fear and build a portfolio with fixed income yeah. and stocks. Yeah. Yeah. Super important to... Uh if you're going to do that to keep, keep the stocks in there. Uh, I know people who like, uh, maybe older people, people in retirement that, uh, that just quit stocks because it was too much risk. But I think not including stocks is a risk. Um, it's just, they don't, they don't see it that way. You know, uh, I, that's an interesting challenge. I, this is why I am so excited that at, Western Washington University, uh, we are involved in a program where uh, shortly every student who goes through there will get about 40 hours of uh, financial literacy 
uh, uh, instruction, uh, education. Because if we can get people to start in their 20s to even be a conservative equity investor and have some equities, the odds are when they get to be 65 or 70, they will be okay with what you just said because they will have experienced it for 40 or 45 years. But you take somebody who doesn't have anything but Social Security or maybe a pension uh, and, and they get to retirement and they haven't taken any, any risk and now they decide to take a rollover uh, of their pension and, 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 and put a bunch of it into the stock market, that's a terrible time to think that you should learn how to be an investor because the odds of you bailing out uh, and hurting yourself are so high. So I'm fine with people being all equity in retirement or some equity in retirement, but I'm not fond of people who have never ever been in equities to decide that equities now need to be an important part of my portfolio. I think it, it, it tends not to work well for those people. Paul, we've been going at it for almost an hour now. Yeah. Um, where could people go to find you? Uh, and also, is there anything else going on in your world that you might want to share? The thing that, that I'm hoping is going to do the most good for people who follow our work, and you go to paulmerriman.com uh, to, uh, to access 700 articles, YouTube, uh, <laughs> podcasts, got a lot of stuff there to help. But we have a thing called boot camp. And it's not, it's not everything I want it to be yet, but it's on the way. And that is right on our homepage. If you go in and you read about eight articles and you listen to about eight podcasts and you watch about eight videos, you are going to know the best work that we have to offer. And if you're not interested in taking the time to do that, I suggest you invest in a target day fund. So, um, uh, I, yeah, we're figuring out ways, I think, to help people through this process and be more organized. I, as I think you know, Jose, we're not a very organized organization. And it's my fault because I'm trying to help first-time investors, last-time investors, investing for grandchildren. Uh, I'm trying to do it all. I'm 80 years old. I got to stop that because uh, I can't do this forever. And I got to really focus. Who am I going to be able to help uh, over the next 10 years of my life? And I got to tell you, I like, like nothing better than if I help you because I really admire what I think you do. And you're going to be around a long time uh, telling whatever tale you're going to tell. But hopefully our work uh, will continue to have some impact uh, on on what you're sharing with your listeners. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, make sure to go to paulmerriman.com. You have an email newsletter. Make sure to check that out. I have my own slow and steady. Go to slowbrewfinance.com. And I thank you, Paul, for your time. Thank you, Jose. Good luck.